This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines geoengineering as the large scale manipulation of a specific process central to controlling Earth's climate for the purpose of obtaining a special benefit. You get all that? The idea of it has had a bit of an unspoken moratorium around it in the science community, but in recent years, it's been climbing back into conversations around climate change, prompting folks to ask what measures could or even should be taken in order to rein in the impacts of global warming. So, what exactly is it? Well, there are two types of geoengineering. Carbon geoengineering, which basically looks to remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere, and solar geoengineering, which looks to prevent a fraction of the sunlight hitting the Earth in order to help cool the planet. Both kinds are ethically fraught, but for the purpose of this segment, we want to focus on solar geoengineering, the one heating up a lot of debate online and at science conferences. According to Harvard's Solar Geoengineering Research Program, this could look like thinning cirrus clouds in order to emit more long-wave radiation from the Earth to space, or even using planes to scatter tiny reflective particles into our upper atmosphere in order to reflect sunlight back into space and keep the planet from heating up further. If you're thinking this sounds like a wild movie plot, you aren't alone. Frankly, my first reaction when I first heard that this existed was, you know, you've got to be kidding. This sounds nuts. That's Gernot Wagner, a climate economist with the Columbia Business School and author of Geoengineering, The Gamble. He's also the co-founder of Harvard's Solar Geoengineering Research Program. So the idea has been around forever, um, largely because volcanoes have been doing this forever. Let's back up a bit. In 1991, a stratovolcano in the Philippines known as Mount Pinatubo erupted to produce Earth's second largest eruption in more than half a century, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. In doing so, the volcano produced the largest sulfur dioxide eruption cloud ever measured, expelling roughly 17 million tons, that's metric tons with two ends, of it into the atmosphere. Scientists say that massive dark eruption cloud ended up dropping the global temperature 0.5 degrees Celsius in the year that followed. For a rapidly warming planet, that was a very big deal. Basically, eruption clouds indicate to scientists that when reflective particles like sulfate aerosols or calcium carbonate scatter into our stratosphere, it could potentially help cool the planet. But there lies a bigger question. Should we be applying it? Wagner says the answer to that lies in research. We think we know enough to be able to say, yeah, it's worth studying further because there are potentially large net benefits of considering solar geoengineering as part of the climate policy portfolio. Do we know enough to know whether to pull the trigger? Frankly, my answer would be, we don't yet know enough. We need to do the research. Critics of geoengineering argue that even research into the subject, never mind the implementation, is the last thing we should be doing. I think what scares me the most is um, the power that comes with it. Um, the, the very idea that a small group of people or nations or actors could actually have you know, control over the global thermostat and actually be able to implement a technology that would affect every living thing on Earth, you know, that would be able to actually manipulate global ecosystems at a planetary scale with irreversible harm and impact. That is something I find terrifying. That's Lily Four, the deputy director of the Climate and Energy Program for the Center for International Environmental Law. For FUR, concerns with geoengineering include its lack of a global governing body for it, the potential weaponization of it between countries, as well as the motivation behind some of those supporting it. Oil, gas and coal are profiting from that and are using this as a shield and cover to expand their business right now in the crucial years where we need to stop that expansion and start the phase out. Four says there are also major concerns for termination shock if solar geoengineering is implemented. The idea of termination shock is that if we were to start and then suddenly stop solar geoengineering, 
the planet could potentially go through a whiplash that would make temperatures rapidly rise at a rate that could lead to catastrophic results. So where does the US stand on geoengineering? In 2022, Congress directed the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop an interagency working group with folks like NASA, NOAA, and the Department of Energy to manage near-term climate hazard risk and coordinate research in climate intervention. This group was also tasked with establishing a framework to provide guidance on transparency, engagement, and risk management for publicly funded work in solar geoengineering research. It will be very interesting to see where research into geoengineering takes us in the next few years. Speaking of research, NOAA is currently trying to learn more about that upper layer of our atmosphere. Scripps News national correspondent Meg Hilling takes us behind the scenes for an exclusive look at the lab working to decode the makeup of our stratosphere one flight at a time. It's a research mission unlike any other. Most parts of the atmosphere matter to us in one way or another. And in the case of NOAA's Sabre mission, the focus is on our stratosphere. The stratosphere is an important region of our atmosphere because that's where the ozone layer exists. Um, the ozone layer is what shields us from a lot of the ultraviolet rays from the sun. Using a converted Cold War era bomber, NOAA's Chemical Sciences Laboratory is working to decode the makeup of our stratosphere. So there might be questions as to, well, the stratosphere, it's remote. Um, there's not much air there. Why do we care about it one way or another? And, and the answer to that really is because it does play a significant role in climate. The plane, which just completed a series of flights above the Arctic in Alaska, is equipped with 17 sampling instruments, making it basically an airborne laboratory. Almost there. With pilots in pressurized suits, the plane soars across the stratosphere miles above the ground. During hours long flights, these sampling instruments collect extensive data on trace gases and aerosols, providing insight as to the state of the stratosphere and the processes occurring there. Going to the high latitude and making measurements um, allows us to see sort of the, the end point of these stratospheric processes. In this case, we went up and we made measurements of uh, various trace gas species that tell us how old, how long that air has been in the stratosphere, as well as all of the aerosol components to understand microphysics and composition. Back at their lab in Boulder, Colorado, the team behind Sabre are analyzing the data collected from the flights in Alaska. The goal is to use the information collected from these flights and others to help inform policy decisions regarding emissions and potential climate intervention measures. We take all of our understanding, we put them into, into global models, and then we run it forward and we say, okay, this is our understanding of the atmosphere, and we can then take that model and run it forward and say, we understand how the atmosphere is going to evolve. We understand how the climate is gonna change when these various things happen. A lot of the measurement tools used on board the plane, like this, are actually built from scratch here on site and patented. That's because there isn't exactly a store that has the instruments no one needs to answer the questions its team is asking. One of the, the pieces of the challenge is, is that they've got to be on a plane, right? And so if you want to put these things on a plane, they have to be relatively light and they have to be relatively small in terms of their footprint. Emphasis on relatively. The Palms instrument uh, measures particulate matter composition, so smoke from fires or dust from dust storms, sea spray from, from oceans. We can see if those particles are coming from above. Are they raining down from outer space? Are they coming from special sources like spacecraft debris or pieces of rockets that are being ablated in the upper atmosphere. As the team gets to work preparing these instruments for the next series of flights in 2024, they say we've got a lot more to learn about the atmosphere right above our heads. The data that we get really is kind of a gold mine, but it's also a snippet, right? We're really trying to use this data and leverage it in the best possible way. Meg Ling, Scripps News, Boulder, Colorado.